Good morning, everybody. It's Dr. Bill Williams on the Influencers Podcast. Once again, Monday morning's here. We are glad that we can uh, go all the way to Buffalo Grove, Illinois, and we're going to introduce you to my friend, Jim Lillig. Hello, Jim. Good to see you. NSI Industries Digital Marketing Director. Welcome to the Influencers Podcast today. Thanks, Dr. Bill. Appreciate you having me on. It's always good to be up in Illinois. I think that um, I've been dealing with the West Coast and the East Coast, sometimes down in Florida. So it's good to have somebody from the Midwest. Yeah, we're we're uh, we're a hardy bunch, so to speak, and we don't. Uh, as my my boss says, we're we're inherently cheap, but we we, we don't mind shoveling our own snow. And and quite frankly, we kind of look forward to it. Some of us. <laughs> I spent a few uh, cold days up there in Chicago, mm, up in uh, hard to do the windy city. So. I don't know if you are close to the Windy City, but man, I know what Cole's like, and it, it lives in Chicago. <laughs> well, the Windy City was actually not named after the weather at all. It was named after an exposition that was made here um, in like prior to 1900. And uh, the writers and people from Chicago would just talk about how great the city was. And so all the writers in the West Coast and East Coast got tired of hearing them. And they said, uh, well, it's the Windy City because they're just blowing blowing hot air about it. So that's how it got the name. The windiest city is actually Boston, but it is cold here. It got to minus 35 last week in the wind chill. So yeah, definitely, you know, we can see some cold weather. Well, we're glad you survived it all. <laughs> Tell us more. Uh, we want to hear about your business, your uh, stake in the uh, hardware industry. Tell us about what you do. Well, uh, let's see. Well, where were you? What happened? Who were you surrounded by? Uh, well, I was, a, I tell you what, I went to school for applied psychology. I have a degree in that uh, from the great Loyola University of Chicago, but uh, I got out of school and I was a painting contractor. I, I started painting houses in college and got on to be a manager and then did sales and had my own territory and painted, you know, Victorian homes and Frank Lloyd Wright homes in and around the Chicagoland area for 10 years, um, painted probably more Frank Lloyd Wright homes than any human being had. I had 40 guys and we had 400 people in the company. But one day um, I was painting a, a, a job, a, a big apartment complex hallways and my crew didn't show up and I got a call, a beeper that something was bad with my mom. And my mom had gone to the hospital and within 30 minutes she was going to be paralyzed from the neck down and I couldn't go. And that was when I decided that's when I don't want to be a painter and I don't want to have to do this. And I want to be able to have a job that I can't don't don't have to be dependent on like this. And so that was the day that I decided that's it. I'm going to go into the Internet and I worked my way. That was in my mid 30s and saw the Internet. And the first thing I was is saw a bulletin board from a place called uh, Cape of Good Hope. Um, and I was like, I'm talking to somebody halfway around the world. All right. That's pretty cool. That's going to change things. And that's what I saw when I was 33. And ever since then, I'm 60 now, so almost 30 years doing this. Um, that's why I do what I do today, because I didn't want to be a painting contractor and I didn't want to be swinging a brush when I was 50 years old. And so um, and it's motivated me ever since to, to just keep learning and keep doing what what I love. And what I, I didn't know digital marketing was a thing when I went to college. It wasn't, wasn't a thing. <laughs> so, so, so that's how I ended up where I am today. I, I have a passion for what I do because I, I, I worked my literal tail off uh, painting homes and training hundreds of people and managing hundreds of people and, and not in, in this space, but I was able to apply it when I worked at Bosch to uh, contractors to know what their world looks like every day and how can I how can I, as a marketer, understand that and, and apply design thinking, empathize and define and ideate based on solving their problems? You know, that's probably, probably as close to anybody else's um, career path. You and I have a real parallel. You know, I found out about bulletin boards in the 1990s. Uh, <laughs> 80s. Yeah, yeah, 80s, 90s, yeah. And then... Um, I always secretly wanted to do something other than dentistry, even though I did it for 47 years. <laughs> and so I was always trying to find out what's what's the easy way to make a living. <laughs> Instead of digging in people's mouths. Yeah, I would imagine that's probably, you know, and, and you know, they say dentists have a very uh, different look on. But I will say something about dentists and having done digital marketing for 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 physicians. Um, 
doctors, and no offense to any doctors who are listening, are not the greatest businessmen that I've ever met. But I can tell you that dentists and um, skin doctors, dermatologists are probably the smartest businessmen I've ever, they should have gotten MBAs rather than doctorate degrees because most of them are brilliant, brilliant um, marketers. The problem is they just have nowhere to, to do it. My dentist is really brilliant. Problem is he couldn't find out how to move the, the pin to get his Google My Business to go to the right entrance of his business, right? But they know these things, right? You go to a doctor, they're like, what? What are you talking about? Right, Google who? Google my, I don't know anything. I've got patients. I've got a lot of people. But dentists, and it seems like dermatologists have a great uh, marketing affinity and, and have good digital uh, savvy. Yeah, you're, you're right on target there. Dentists want to be their own bosses. Dentists are solo practitioners for the most part. And they run cook chief bottle washer at all you know we're, we're the <laughs> we're the sole person in our business so we have to know all steps of it right and i don't know why dermatologists are except for they can't use insurance as much so maybe they they have that uh, need to be independent yeah well better marketing so tell us about um some growth factor in your life that made you go you started with the painting story and how you got into the digital world. Mm -hmm. So how did you get into what left, led you to uh, the, the remake? Um, well, I mean, it wasn't so much a failure in that space as far on there. It was more, um, you know, I mean, I was playing in a band and we thought we were going to get signed and we were, you know, in my twenties and what have you. I thought, you know, hell, this is it. That Smashing Pumpkins got signed, a material issue got signed. That's it. We're the next ones. We were we were playing the same circuit as them. And so we thought we were going to get signed. And, I, and at about 27, I said, yeah, we're not going to get signed. So, so I went to work for for Aramark. I quit my painting job and went to work for Aramark and learned a little bit about corporate culture there. Um, did sales for them and, and did well and then went back into the painting. Um, but the failure that, that I had was not here, but the greatest failure I ever learned from was uh, working in digital after I had some early successes. Um, I didn't really know what to do, but I didn't uh, because nobody kind of the gases are still forming about digital marketing. And I worked with a guy who represented uh, um, a guy who had a show on television from the 70s to 80s that predated um, uh, 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 MTV. And um, he's since passed on. And, and, and uh, I believe because he had a big name and because this guy talked me into this, uh, it, was, it was great. And I spent about six months working on this whole project to bring him back and make him, you know, new again using cartoons and a bunch of different stuff that, that was at the time would have put him at, at the forefront of digital, um, especially in the music world. Um, I went through a whole meeting with the gentleman um, and four hours after six months of work on this and pretty much throwing everything else away and saying, you know, this is, this is going to be huge. Um, the, the gentleman said, you know what, Jim, what, what uh, the kids today are really into. And I said, well, what's that, Mr. Kirshner? He said, Dakota rings. <laughs> I, I said, thank you very much, Mr. Kirshner. And the man I'm talking about is Don Kirshner, who, if you remember, had a show called The Rock Concert from 72 to 82, which predated uh, MTV. So um, everybody from Kansas to Led Zeppelin was on that show, and they would go on Friday nights and suspend their tours to go on that show. It's how big it was at the time. When we met him, uh, he had had some issues with legal issues and lost the right to use his own name. So we were trying to bring him back, and I thought this was going to be a great project. So my greatest, the way that I came back from and recovered from it was I learned that never to believe anybody and really fact check everything. And if you think it's a good idea, it's probably needs two or three people's opinions to get that. So to, to, to get some feedback. So what I learned from that was try, make sure you check out who you get in business with. Trust and verify. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I call it the Snopes, right? Snopes.com, if you're familiar with that, S-N-O-P-E-S. It's like the oldest fact-checking site on the Internet. Um, but I should have Snoped myself um, on there. So that that's my biggest failure. But the cool thing about it was is I learned so much along the way that 
I it set me up for other things down the road. And that's that's the one big thing you can take away from any of this is if you always keep learning, you can't you, you'll always have success at some point in your life because you'll learn something that you'll apply from your failures. That's a good segue to the next question about failure is you've seen a lot of people make it and a lot of people fail. What are some of the common characteristics of failing to do it right? Failing to plan. <clears throat> fail to plan. And that, that's really the number one reason why people fail. They, they rush in. They, they, they fail to plan for the unexpected. They fail to plan for success. They fail to plan for failure. Um, you know, if you if you go into I have a campaign and I'm kicking off that, you know, I've I've gone 10 levels deep to make sure that I've backed up the backup to the backup to the backup. Right. That's why things fails, because you didn't anticipate failure. If you anticipate failing, it, you'd be surprised like, oh, OK, well, now I, I, I'm not like panicking. I know how to pivot on this. But you're using in digital. The beautiful thing about digital is data that. that Data will drive all your decisions. You know, just let your audience tell you what what to do, and then do it. Don't don't think about it. Um, if you're not having, um, if you don't have a, a very robust understanding of GA4, you should. If you don't have Hotjar or some other uh, screen uh, uh, um, 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 utility that you can look at people's sessions and look at what people are doing on your pages and analyze, you know how the UX is is working or not working. You're just ignoring, you know, things that are sitting out in the open, telling you what direction to go in. Sounds to me like you hit a real gem there when you said you have to have uh, 10 levels deep in your backup. Nobody has ever said that before on the Influencer podcast. So a depth of backup. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, 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 it behooves you to understand, like, I don't just work with one ad network. I work with four because I want to make sure that I keep uh, the trade desk um, uh, 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 um, you know, honest. Um, I also use Foo Analytics, F-O-U analytics.com to, to install code that will tell me the bot traffic that comes from specific sources, right? I, I hate fraud. I have a 96.4 IVT. That means the ads that I serve go to valid uh, destinations. The industry average is 75%. That means that 20, that most marketers are okay with 25% of their budget being frittered away on, on stuff that never no eyeball ever saw. I, I, I'm from the Midwest, I said before. I don't that I don't put up with that. <laughs> so so that's why you back up the backup to the backup, you know. It, it's like in basketball, help the help the helper, right? So, you know, so that's why I see people fail is because they fail to plan significantly for either success or failure or meh, you know, <laughs> I got nothing. Is it, was it successful? Was it not? I don't know. We should probably shake it up. The beautiful thing about digital, it's not like print. I started in print, you know, you can't change print. Once it's gone, it's gone. You know, these are like, and, yeah, that's very comforting. You know, the words that you say about how deeply you don't like the fraud, I've seen so many um, campaigns that that reach places you don't even want to market to. Yeah, I have a list of 725 A-list sites. If my if my ads aren't served on there, I'm not paying you. But, I mean, you can play whack a mole. That's, that's fine, and junior marketers do it all day long. But if you're if you want to, and and you know, and agencies are like, oh, we're making our money by playing whack a mole for you. It's that's not it. It's look, most of the universe is only these 725 sites. You know, 80% of the traffic in the world, uh, on U.S. world, is coming from these 725, 725 sites. The rest are all long tail, right? Which are fine, except I don't need to be next to, you know, uh, what was one? Pupswithchopsticks.com. That was one of the sites we were being served from. I'm like, that's not where I want to meet my my intended market. I don't want to meet them on Pups with Chopsticks because they're, they're getting recipes. They're not worried about cord grips. <laughs> yeah, your specific industry really is nicheable. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we make the stuff that ends up on the floor of electricians' trucks, right? And 10 other people do it. So we know that we have to try harder, that we have to do different things, that we have to be bold. We have to, to go and, and put our necks out a little bit to do things that are different and that will stand out to distributors because those are the people that sell our product to the people who use our product. 
So in, in, in from a manufacturer standpoint, it's a very difficult shot to get to, to understand that, you know, like if you sell Nike shoes, well, you can buy Nike shoes at 400 different places, right? And people know about Nike shoes, but, but people don't always know about RTKs that are made for damp and wet situations like tunnels and bridges, right? So they need to be educated at the end user, but then the end user can't just go to me and buy it. They've got to go to a distributor to buy it. So I've got to educate the distributor on, as well as the end user. And hopefully all that comes together without with me facilitating it as the manufacturer, but having no part in the sale whatsoever, because it's, I'm not making, I made the sale to the distributor. Now I'm trying to help him, that person sell it to the end user. Let's bring our audience up to speed. They, they might not grasp exactly what, NSI Industries makes and sells. So tell us that before you. Oh yeah, no problem. NSI, about- yeah, NSI owns 14 companies in the electrical space is where I work. Um, everything from Bridgeport fittings, which is uh, anything that goes on the end of a piece of conduit or a cable run um, that fits into a wall, that, that a switch on the wall um, that you would know of, a back end, a lot of things that hold things in place for um, the, the the holding of of wires and 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 conduit, um, and then you've got Remke, the company I came from, that builds industrial style things for plant floors to power, uh, get power to robots and to to transfer data back and forth between the robots and the control panels. Everything we make is for electricians and for electrical engineers to install either on a house, in a commercial situation or or an industrial situation. So um, it's a bit of a niche industry, although it's, you know, a $48 billion industry. Um, It's it's kind of big, Um, but you know, it's part of construction. And so we're like one tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of the construction budget. But even that tiny little bit is a lot of money. <laughs> so, you know, you know, you're talking about billions like that. That's nearly the size of dentistry. Well, everybody has teeth for sure, but also everybody has electricity. So, and there's a lot more um, fittings in the walls of your house than there are teeth in your head. So, um, <laughs> so, so that's I think I I'd I look at the scale of that. Unless you have squirrels, though, they don't get cavities. Oh, <laughs> no, but squirrels do like warm wires. So you know, <laughs> in your car sometimes too. So, so in your marketing for mm-hmm. a niche business, what are some success secrets that others can model from? Oh, I can tell you that easy. First one, and the niches are the riches, and rhyme it with another word because you'll remember it better. But my point is, is that when you go deep into a subject matter, the deeper you go, the richer it gets because you find the people that are really interested and willing to spend money on whatever subject matter you're going. So if you're trying to be everything to everybody, that never works. You need to you need to go into a specific niche. If Dr. Bill Williams said, hey, I want to be an Internet marketer and didn't like capitalize on the fact that, oh, I kind of know dentistry. So maybe I might want to talk to dentists because I know what I'm talking about. He went deep and he's very successful at it. The deeper you go, the richer it gets. So that's number one. The second one is if you stop learning like a shark stops moving, you're dead. You're dead. Everything changes. AI in the last year has changed everything we know about SEO. It changed everything we know about content marketing. It changes the entire thing, uh, way we look at, at, at marketing to customers because now I can put them on a track that listens to millions of people and then says, oh, out of the millions of people that we have, these people did the exact thing we wanted to do. So let's do that. I couldn't do that. I couldn't make that analysis. So failing to, to, to keep up with your learning, to invest in yourself and invest in your team, which is really the thing now. I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm 60 years old. So I might be a lot, feel a lot younger than my peers as far as that, because in my mid thirties, I adopted all this and said, this is the way I'm going to go. But at the same time, you know, I have people on my team who are much younger than me who resist AI. And and the third secret is embrace AI and how it can enhance what you do to make you better. But if you fear it and you say it's going to take my job, it will. <laughs> it certainly will. But you got to get ahead of it. You got to be the cowboy. You can't be you can't be the you can't be the cows in the in the uh, in the in the pen. You got to be the cowboy. So you've got to wrangle that AI and make it your, you know, proverbial uh, minion, so to speak. So I totally agree with what you're saying. 
It's true, Jim. I, I got my first computer in 1981. I got my first website in 1997. Wow. And I got AI started last year to work for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I would be where I am today if I hadn't been an early adopter in each of those. And wow. the word is, if you don't adopt AI, you'll be just as behind as if you didn't computerize, you didn't go on the web. Right. Well, there's, a great, there's a great book that you that I'd like to pass along. It's called The AI Powered Enterprise by a man named Seth Early, E-A-R-E-Y. And Seth, in the first chapter, he describes a thing called the Granger bot. And this is how things will be bought industrially. It won't be bought by a keyboard. It'll be bought by people talking just like me. Go check this out, GrangerBot. Go do this for me, GrangerBot. Go grab this for me, GrangerBot. You already do it with Alexa. You already do it at home. And it's just going to transfer into uh, purchasing, purchasing as well, too. So, AI will be your uh, personal assistant, and you, you will not be doing the same thing again ever once you have learned how to use AI properly, right? Um, you know what? I, I use it like I'm doing. I have to do reviews um, and goal setting. So I, I've used it to help me write smart goals. So I'm, I'm finding that just like the mundane things I do in my day, I can do better just because I'm now tapping into the to the learnings of the, you know, basically the our little world, right? Or Google's little world or Microsoft's little world, depending on which Bard or, or OpenAI who you're using. Um, I use both, um, but I found there's this, there's a, um, a program I got for one of my guys called AnyWord that you, allows you to train AI on just your content. So let's say you have a campaign, you have white papers, you've got ads, you've got you know uh, landing pages, you've got blog posts, you've got all this campaign content you want to throw in there and say, now you have the knowledge that my team has, write this in this style for this, right? That's very powerful when you can train it on your own large language model yourself, right? So llamas are what, what all AI is, is trained on. It depends on which llama you're, 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 follow, you're, you're following, right? So I'd rather train it on my own llama instead of an alpaca llama that has been trained in South Africa. So for the last two and a half years. So my stuff was is gonna be better because it's better for what I do. So we're learning to use that tool. And that's something I think is gonna become much, much more prevalent across the, across all industries is they'll all have their own AI training for in-house content. Yeah, I, I see the AI being put into different niches, consultant niches, for instance, for dentistry. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, you know, we've got tools and techniques based on AI. It's the new buzzword, but it's not just the buzzword. It's an actual fact. Yeah. No, I, I went to the dentist two weeks ago and I'm telling you, the guy, he, he popped up a picture and he says, yeah, these are the areas that AI has determined needs to be looked at. And I said, are, are you looking at it? He goes, yeah, it's pretty accurate. It needs a little help over here. I go, are you helping the program by telling it? And he goes, yeah, I could. I'm not doing it now. <laughs> So, so even even the people that are supposed to train it correctly, but it did, he he did he, I said did it identify the correct areas in my mouth that need to be looked at? He goes a hundred percent. He goes it 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 no it has looked at a billion mouths. He goes I haven't. <laughs> so who's gonna win? A billion mouths or me? He goes it goes probably a billion mouths. I go but that's why I'm here is to make sure that if it's really serious we can start to move down it. But that aid. Oh, my Lord, think about it this way. If they just put that probe in somebody's mouth in, in India who's never seen a dentist before, how much could they learn from that? How much could they? I mean, just when you start to when you think about the global scope of it and when you start to expand it beyond just one person, you look at it like, how can you help the English? You know, so, no. <laughs> so, but I mean, any culture that has traditionally bad health, you know, it starts with their teeth. Your teeth is really the. You know, any dentist will tell you if your teeth are bad, your health is going to be bad. So it's, it, you know, it just it's it goes without saying that your teeth are the gateway to, to good health. And so I don't know, but dentist, but AI adopting it, not adopting it, huge mistake. Adopting it, even if you don't know what the hell you're doing and you're just trying it, you're going to learn something. 
And once again, what's the, the, the tenet? Always be learning. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, everything you're saying about dentistry being the gateway to health, right on target. Uh, dentist looking at uh, AI being used to detect cavities and things, right on target. I had a, a software engineer interview me the other day to join their company as a, an advisor because they wanted their AI software to be uh, up to date and have a dentist on board. They were technicians, but they weren't dentists. <laughs> okay. But they showed me the product and it was showing exactly what you say. It was, it was, it was proof of concept already showing that, yeah, this thing works. Mm -hmm. It can identify as cavity as good as I can. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that's where it is. So hey, what motivates me internally? I love that question. <laughs> that's concerned. I don't know. I like, I like, um, I like mentoring. I love, uh, I love um, helping. And, and I, I learned, I learned a long time ago. I don't know everything. I got three girls who've taught me that I know almost nothing. Um, and that, uh, you know, as they get older, they, they realize that I might know something, um, but you know, they're all in their 20s and early 30s. And so uh, what motivates me internally, I just try to be a good person. I just try to, just try to, you know, think about people and their situation and try and give more than I take. I, I think you probably do a good job of that just based on what time we spent together, your, your willingness to share and uh, the stories about how your life transformed from a psychologist to a painter to digital marketer. I mean, that's quite an interesting journey. Yeah. I didn't want to work with crazy people. So that, that was what motivated me out of the psychology. <laughs> but I, 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 and also the fact that when I, at the time I graduated in 1982, the going rate for a lab, uh, a psych assistant was $12 an hour. So I, 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 you know, I, I don't think I was going to make much of a living on twelve bucks an hour. So I was already making way more money than that being a painting contractor. So I said, oh, we'll just stick with the business thing, see where that pays off. So, yeah, going back to your business of what you're doing now in digital marketing, is there a company motto? Ah, uh, connecting possibilities. I love it. That's good. <laughs> uh, why would somebody buy from your company versus some other? Um, well, number one, you know, we're, we're our, our focus on uh, Made in America. Um, we have just per recently purchased a company here in Chicago, CPI, cast products that will triple the amount of ca uh, zinc castings that we're able to do made in America. Most of our competition is made in uh, China and, and India. Um, we have a huge program coming with the IIJA, which you've heard about, and it's trillions of, uh, $1.2 trillion. Well, uh, part of that bill is, says that if you want that money, you better have your uh, materials made in the United States. So we're hoping that that's going to be... Us. And we have a whole campaign uh, around a webinar that uh, with a, with a, uh, an expert that buys from the government that explains the the, the complex rules for getting paid uh, for these types of, of, of awards. And then we have a buyer's checklist that's gated content. Um, and like I said, I have 15 different ways that we're going to market this. Um, but basically, once they download that buyer's checklist, you get in my CRM, you're going to be a, you know, a sales qualified lead. So um, yeah, it's it, it, why somebody buys from us. We're, we're American made. Our quality is, is second to none. Um, and quite frankly, we try to be easy to do business with. And so we're, that's what we're, that's what we're working towards. I would buy from you just from what you said. <laughs> but am I the ideal client? Who is? Well, uh, my ICP, I've got several ICPs. One, one, I just I had this discussion the other day because one of my goals this year is to get my, my, my team to understand, you know, that our total addressable market, our TAM, is about 650,000 people. So when you take that in context of the 320 million people that I could market to, that's kind of a, mm, that's not even a needle in a haystack. That's an eye hole of the needle in the haystack. And so what, what I'm trying to do is, is get our stuff um, to the right person. So ideally, you know, the number one thing I want to go is distributors, right? Some people that make purchasing distributor uh, uh, decisions at distributors. Um, that's my number one thing. And then people who sell and do operations at distributors because they have to install our product and sell it to the people who are coming in to buy it. I um, mean, the second ideal client is, uh, is a, uh, uh, a contractor because they're the ones who are going to ultimately buy our product. So I want with them, I want to, you know, highlight the products benefits, but I also want to highlight, you know, that our product is, is helping you be the hero of your job. 
And that's really what I try to keep in all my storytelling is I'm not, my product isn't the hero. My product is part of your journey, but my product is helping you be the hero. And that's why I always try to keep in, 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 I, in the back of my head when I'm creating stories to reach that ICP. More people doing marketing should understand the process you just explained, Jim. Well, it's just it's just design thinking. I mean, be honest with you. If you if you really, I mean, and I, I say design thinking, look it up. There's an actual process to design thinking, and, and that starts with you're solving for the end user. You're solving to empathize with that person's plight, right? Every story has an arc, right? You begin, have a need, you meet somebody along the way that helps you understand how to get to that point, and then you get to the point either you fail or you win, one of the two. That's every story has the same arc. How you fill that in, that's up to you and how you make how you position your product. You know, I sell running shoes. Because I sell running shoes, you're gonna win a marathon. No, but that's I have to sell that to people. Right? So that that's that's the ideal of, of that sort of stuff. Truly understand it. And I think being a dentist, I understand marketing from a local standpoint. And I used to teach dentists how to market better. So they stand out in their field. A lot of them didn't understand anything about marketing. And tell the story, you know, what does the patient want as a result? They don't want the features. They want the benefits. Yeah. Feature function benefit, right? Sell the sizzle, not the bacon, right? So that's the... You know, the oldest tenets in, in, in marketing are, are still always true. That's why I always laugh when they go, oh, SEO, it's so hard. Well, yeah, from a technical standpoint, it has gotten harder. But from a content standpoint, the same thing. I, I put the first ad up on Google. I, I can tell you I've been doing this a very long time. And and the number one thing that works for SEO, I always people say, how long have you been doing this? I, I was doing SEO for Ask Jeeves. Um, so it, the, the, the part of it is, is that if you write good content, first of all, a, a, a bot has to, to read it. So you have to understand the technical writing of it, all the, the number of keywords, the keyword density, how you're using your H1s and H2s, your bumpers, uh, how the number of words you're using, how close positive and negative sentiment are from the keywords you're using in the actual text itself. All of those factors, you have to hit those things right on to get SEO correct, right? But the number one thing that SEO is still going to always score well for is it original content? Is it helpful to the end user? Does it answer questions? And if you understand, I'll give you a big tip for your audience. If you understand answering questions, guess what? Generative AI, the pink stuff in Google, the pink results in Google, that's, guess what? It's answering questions because what does an assistant, what does a chat bot do? It asks questions. It's trying to get answers to things. So if you're writing in a way that you're answering questions and you're asking questions and then answering questions, that's a style that always works for SEO. Always. It never fails. But you have to know your keywords. So I, I, I assume, you know, you know about keywords everywhere. It's cheap. It's easy. And it's pretty darn good for getting just some basic ideas. And then use Yoast or, or Rank Math um, for your WordPress uh, sites. Both of those. Yoast is much easier than Rank Math. Rank Math, you might need an MBA. But, um, you know, if you, if you can understand it, it it'll put you in, in the first page within, you know, a couple of months. Nothing happens overnight anymore. We used to build, probably remembers the days when you could put plus signs in, in comments in, in the first paragraph and you'd be on the first page of Google within seconds, right? So there used to be all these hacks, but they've got a whole hundreds of people that are just going after hacks now. They didn't really care before. They were like, oh, only a handful of people know about it, so it won't be a big deal. But now, you know, everybody knows. So that's where I just kind of went off the rails on that one. But Hopefully, you know, that gives you some idea of some of the things that, that I get involved in and that I think are, you know, something you should be looking at. Yeah, I always tell my audience when I hear something that's really deep, I go, aren't you glad there are experts in the business <laughs> so you don't have to do all that, what you just heard? Yeah, it would have been nice. The <laughs> there weren't. I mean, there wasn't anybody. I mean, I learned at the feet of some people that, you know, just – they didn't have any idea what they were doing. They were just doing it. And, 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 and whether it worked or not, they didn't know. And that's, the, that's still true today. You just don't know. And don't be afraid of failure. That's like the, the number one thing that, that, that if I can give any advice is don't be afraid of failure. Failure is the only way you learn. Success only, only tells you that you didn't fail. But 
failure is the only way you're going to learn to get to success because if you don't clear out the space around you, you'll never know what caused it. And that's the part that, that you, if you don't know what caused it, you can't replicate it. If you can't replicate it, it's not sustainable. And, and even businesses that are sustainable today, in three years from now, something will change that. And you have to be able to pivot. When I worked at Bosch, we went from being a tool company to being a company that also provides services, such as where's your tool? You're not buying. A, it, 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 this is a great thing in marketing, especially when you market <laughs> power drills. People don't buy a power drill because they want to own a drill. They own a power drill because they want to make a hole. That's right. So what we sell now is the ability to make holes. So if you need, if that, if your ability is stunted, I'll sell you an insurance program that basically will drop that thing with a drone within 30 minutes anywhere in the United States. They're not doing that yet, but that's where it's going. Just like I tell my granddaughter, she's six. I go, by the time you drive, you won't drive. You'll be, a, it'll be a mobility rental service and you literally will rent hours upon how many miles you want to go in a month and a car will just appear within five minutes and just be cruising the neighborhood and it, it I said, that's the way Ford will sell cars in the future because people don't want to own cars. They don't want, they want to own the right to be able to go somewhere. They want to be able to own the ability to do things, but they don't want to own the physical accoutrement that, that goes with it and the maintenance of all that. That's mm -hmm. that, 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 literally that, that everybody needs to look at that as a business model for their business because subscription models is, is where it's going. I mean, that's even my, my wife's pain doctor now has a subscription to like, if you're a Medicare patient, she'll give you better service if, if you pay her an extra thousand dollars a year to be in her like club. I'm like, what the? How would I have been a good service? <laughs> so, whatever. Look. Concierge medicine has been talked about for at least a decade and uh, it's coming along. It's, it's a subscription service, like you say. Everybody's trying to find a subscription. Like I said, that's and it, it works great. That's where I started in the internet. And subscription services, but um, that's what everybody's business. Bosch had to change from, you know, hey, people buy tools to people buy a subscription to own the right to, to do things and we'll supply the means to get those things done. It's a, it's, a, it's a design thinking shift in the way that you look at your business. I like the design shift you talked about. You know, that is the new way. You incorporate the AI. Things change, totally change. Yeah, yeah. What's your five-star client experience? Oh, boy. Well, when I had my own agency for five years, for a dozen years, um, had hundreds of clients, was basically just going above and beyond, right? And delivering, uh, under-promising and over-delivering, right? So never in this space, especially in digital, you don't want to say, oh, you know, I'm going to get you a viral campaign and then we're going to go and do, you know, a million dollars worth of Facebook ads, and you know, but for like three dollars, right? So never over-promise in, in, in my business. It's always... Well, we're going to run this up the flagpole and see if it works. But the data suggests that we're looking in the right place. So number one, data driven, data driven um, decision making, um, leaving egos and opinions out of the decision making and putting in the data makes all the sense in there. And that's that's how I've always you know, tried to make it a five car, five star client experience by focusing on the data and focusing on the results and good, bad or indifferent. You should be learning from all of it. How do you get a client to understand their data? Well, it was funny when I was running my agency, you would, I would routinely run into meetings with the CEO of a company. And usually I've dealt with between five and $50 million companies. And <clears throat> those CEOs are typically pretty close to the, close to the wheel, right. Um, in those companies. Right. And so they would come in and say, I was on the website last night and I didn't like this and I didn't like that. And I, this needs to be, and I'm, and I would, you know, politely say, excuse me, time out, sir, but um, how often do you buy our product? Well, I don't buy our product. I'm the CEO of the company. What are you talking about? It's a stupid question. I mean, are you our ideal customer profile? Well, I'm the president of the company. Please just answer the question. Do you buy our product? No. Have you talked to people that buy our product? Yes. And I know. Great. Let me show you the data. Let me show you what your people are doing. Right. Let me show you where they come, what door they come in and which one's most effective. Do you know that? And that's when I, the, 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 the conversation can really start 
is to show them, look, if they came in through the SEO door, here's what they do. If they come in through your, your paid efforts door, here's what they're doing. If they come in through the social door, here's what they're doing. Once he understands all the doors to his house, I mean, um, I, uh, the, you can then start to take and analyze how you can optimize those channels. You can't do it all at once. You cannot eat an elephant in one bite. You have to um, eat an elephant in multiple, multiple bites. So um, that's pretty much where we're at. Beautiful example. Many doors. Some of them you better lock quick. Some of them you better uh, shut so they don't go out the back door. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. So how do you convert clients to brand ambassadors? Um, that is something that I feel like a sale. It's hard for marketing to, to, to do that alone without sales uh, shepherding that, that relationship or customer success shepherding that relationship, right? But a brand ambassador is somebody who just loves your product, right? I have a, I have a, a side client that does packaging and um, he, you know, his, his, the people who use his product, it's compostable packaging, um, love his product and they're fanatical that they're saving the earth and that they are, you know, the next, you know, uh, eco warriors. And so um, those people are really easy to turn into brand ambassadors, right? You know, it's really hard to turn into brand ambassadors is a guy that can buy this from 10 other places and really doesn't get care what gets put in his bag at the end of the day, because he just needs a nut to finish off the job, right? He doesn't care who makes the nut. He doesn't care if it's made in the USA. He just needs a nut to finish the job, right? So turning those people into brand ambassadors, if you want to look at a great example of how that's done, look at Klein Tools. They have people tattooing their logo on their arms. Wow. Milwaukee, Milwaukee <laughs> Tools is another one. They have people tattooing. So you want a real brand ambassador? It's somebody who puts a real tattoo on their real body and is willing to say, I believe in this brand so much that I want to do this with body art. And so the fun thing was at, at uh, uh, World of Concrete, uh, the year after I left, uh, Bosch, they, they had a little, they had a, a Bosch tattoo stand where you could get henna tattoos of Bosch. And they were like, who loves Bosch? And it turns out there's a lot of people that love Bosch that are very, very much crazy about the tools and the quality of that, that Bosch puts in its German engineered tools. So it's you have to look for them. You have to listen for them. And if you're looking for them, the best place to find them is a place called Spark Toro, S-P-A-R-K-T-O-R-O.com. If you've never heard of it, you've been under a rock. Um, but if you haven't been under a rock, you should check this out because what it will look for is your audience's audience. And if you understand social media at all, it's not about getting your audience. Your audience is already in the car. You need to get more people in the car. So you need the people that are in the car to get out of the car, go in their cars, and then take your message out to their people in their cars. And once they get those people in their cars, then they drop them off into your car, right? So that's the concentric circles of social media is you need to create content that not just that your people will share with their audiences. You call that Spark what? Spark Toro, S-P-A-R-K-T-O-R-O.com. Probably one of the most brilliant guys in the world runs that. Um, he's just his mom. I've spoken on the same. She, his mother started Moe's. So if you're familiar with SEO at all, you're you're familiar with Moe's as a as a website as a service. His mother Jillian uh, started that uh, site, and then he's kept this site going. Uh, um, it's just it's very well done, and the, the newsletter is great. The office hours are great, um, and he'll tell you things and and open your mind to things about social media that you just you wouldn't think of on your own and he's just a brilliant a brilliant guy to listen to so that's i can't i can't tell you enough if you're going to win at social media you should probably be using that to find out what your audience's audiences are are interested in and then write content that meets that that's another gem you dropped on us uh sparktoro.com so you're full of good uh information, news, and uh, insights, Jim. Thank you so much. No We're grateful for that. What are you grateful for today? 
I'm grateful that I'm, I wake up every morning. The Lord lets me, lets me come to work every day and a job that I love as far as that. So, uh, you know, I, I have a lot to be grateful for. I have wonderful kids. I've got grandkids. I got a, a beautiful and, and talented and lovely wife who takes care of me like nobody else could. So I'm grateful that my life is, you know, where I'm at today and every day is a blessing. So I just, I thank the Lord every day for that. It sounds like you're very impactful to the family, to the kids. Uh, why is that important to you? Well, because, you know, you can't take it with you. <laughs> but, but people are going to remember. Think of the people that you who are influences in your life or your parents or or anybody. You don't remember. You remember the things that they said to you. You remember the things, the way that they were, the kindness. And and if if they truly were a good person that you wanted other people to be a part of. Um, so. Um, so that's the part that, you know, is really, to me, you know, I just, I always, I have a, a, a side business idea that I always want to put a hologram on a box for your ashes. And, and it, you know, you can record like 20 sayings and your family can just type it in. Like, what did he have to say about, you know, hope, you know, or what have you. And I always think that's a, that'd be a good business model, but I want to be remembered to be, you know, just a good person. Um, somebody that cared about other people that, that, cared what they thought about my, myself and that I always gave, that I, that I try to give more than I, than I take. Um, I have a number of mentoring students and, and, and they're everywhere from just out of college to almost my age um, that I learned so much from. Um, they think they're learning from me. I, I have to turn it around all the time because I learn so much just from their perspective, right? I'm hearing how somebody in their 30s thinks about the way that, that we're doing the marketing is way different than somebody who's in their fifties. And, and that to me, learning, I, I, I do want to teach. That's my, my ultimate goal is I'd love to be able to teach a course um, on digital marketing um, and really like take people for two semesters and have them start a business and do everything. Cause you can start a business online in a heartbeat being an affiliate, right? I used to do that. Um, and so I'd love to take a course that just shows people every aspect of emailing and ad buying and, and, and content development and all those pieces. So when they get out of college and they go into the workplace and somebody asks them, like I do to everybody that comes across my desk, what have you done? And they go, well, I went to college. I go, okay, great. You and 14 million other kids that are going to have a lifetime of debt. What did you, what have you done? Like you didn't need to go to college to do what I need you to do. I, I need you to be smart. I need you to, to think about a business like it's your own. Have you ever owned your own business? And, and, and I go from there. Why not? I mean, really, I mean, it, it, I, I don't, the, the, the people I know who are successful and I've known for 20 plus years who started out like me knowing nothing, the ones that stuck to it, all of them, all of them make well over a hundred thousand dollars a year. And that's just on their own. One kid came to me, we, we trained him up. He was a, he was a car park attendant. When he came to work for myself and a guy named Tom Bell um, down in, in, in Florida, and I, he slept in our offices. He didn't have a place to stay. He didn't have anything. Now he has three houses. He's an internet marketing guru, and he built himself up just from understanding that you can do this, that it can be done. And that's the sort of stuff that I want to be remembered for is having a hand in, in that person's success and for them to say, you know, I... I have one person that, that has been very, very successful and they literally owe a lot for what they, they've done to a, a piece of advice that I gave them early on. So that's the sort of stuff that if I can be, I mean, it sounds so egotistical. So, you know, I, I hate that. So it, it, for being somebody that would give good advice, I guess that would be the best. We enjoy hearing your stories because they're so real and uh, they're coming from the heart. I, I think that you've impacted a lot of people and, uh, you definitely will be remembered as a, a giver, not a taker. How can we support you and how can we have people reach you? Oh, I have nothing to sell. <laughs> I have nothing to peddle. Uh, they can reach me on LinkedIn. It's Jim Lillig on LinkedIn, J-I-M-L-I-L-L-I-G. Um, you know, feel free to connect with me. Um, I, I, I do consulting on the side. Um, I'm not the cheapest person in the world, but I can tell you this, that, you know, um, within 30 minutes or 15 minutes of talking to you and understanding your business, I probably give you at least three really good ideas that will be actionable and you can take to market. And, and 
just been doing this 30 years. So, you know, to me, I, it's, it's, I always tell my team, I'm like, sales will look at a CRM record of a contact and see a totally different story than I'll see. So looking at something with different lenses, I found is always a very good idea for your business because you might be so close to the forest, you can't see the trees and somebody telling you like right in front of you, like, Hey, why don't you send people who haven't come back to you after six months stories about people that don't come to dentists after six months? <laughs> so Take that's sort of stuff. Time. Like, you know, yeah. they don't think about that. When I did collections for 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 Experian, um, doctors thought, you know, after three years, their patients were just going to march right back in, pay their bills, and come back. I'm like, <laughs> the, the data would suggest otherwise. So that's how I look at it. So. That's how you can support me. I, I, I like I said, I have nothing to sell. I, I, I am who I am. I know what I do. So, excellent. Well, thank you for that. And uh, your guest experience on the show. What would you say about it today? Uh, definitely different. I have I haven't been on a podcast in a long time, and it's so nice to be kind of just like asked some kind of almost Colbert like questions. Uh, so it was. It's nice because I usually get industry related stuff and everything on there and yeah. crazy things like that. So, but this was this is good to be able to explain a little about. Yeah, me. we want to make you the star. Uh, show off your personality, which is magnificent. And uh, it's not all about fasters, you know. It's about living life and being available to your friends. I'm gonna give. I'm gonna give you the last word as we go into the final segment. No problem. I would just say, you know, if I if I were going to give advice to anybody is number one, do something. If you're a young, younger person, if you're an older person, you want to get switch things. It's never too old to switch it up. And first of all, the Internet doesn't care how old you are. Um, they really don't. <laughs> as long as you keep going. And the last thing is just be kind, be kind to people. If, if you know, it, it doesn't change from kindergarten. Is it safe? Is it kind? And basically stay connected. That, exactly. Stay connected and take a few days off. So, so there you go. So thank you, Bill, for having me. Oh, yeah. I'm glad to do it. And uh, you guys, if you're trying to get in touch with us and want to be on the show, the Influencer Podcast, go to my QR code here and you can find out on the OVU card all about what I do. Uh, we have all our 140 plus different sessions of the influencer podcast right here on drbillwilliams.tv you'll also find out about our ai technology all our SaaS products we have a lot of ai generated uh content that will be beautiful for your company your business to help you modify and maintain and grow one thing we do is we give away a lot of things jim this o trim is a url shortener we can get custom links and build QR codes and track them. Oh, great. Very, a lot of trackable. QR codes are very effective. If you put them in the right place, they work great, especially on television ads. People forget. Yeah, people don't want to write down anything but the shortest thing they can remember. Yeah, they have a phone. <laughs> well, they can take a picture of it. <laughs> Why do you put a QR code in the middle of this? You know they work. That's right. It's pretty ubiquitous now. People know what to do when they see one. If they want it, they'll just get it. That took a little while. <laughs> it took a while. Way faster than we did. <laughs> I resisted them for quite a while, but now I use them every day. Particularly when COVID came, all the restaurants, the menus went to QR. Yeah, that's kind of annoying. I do like a men I do like a menu. I don't, in most restaurants, I can't see anything anyway, so it's kind of nice because I can can read it on there. So, but QR codes work real well. So do. Uh, 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 SMS for dentists. I mean, that's, you know, lifeblood. You got to have an SMS system as far as that's concerned. So One thing that, we can thing that works great is, is, uh, banners in your signature in emails. You wouldn't think that they work well, but boy, I'll tell you what, our customer service people, we send them out with, with banners out and we change them out every couple of weeks. And I mean, swear the clicks that come from it's hundreds and hundreds of clicks. So it's, it, it, it happened, you know, for a business, if you've got multiple people sending out emails from your business, like transactional emails, don't forget about the, 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 the signature and put a little banner in there on, you know, 300 by 50 banner or 300 by 75. And um, you'd be surprised. That's a good gem because a banner is going to always be seen because you're looking at who sent the email. Yeah, right. Exactly. And then, you know, if they download pictures, then you're going to see the the image that you put there. Um, the nice thing is you can change it up. Um, we use uh, we we got uh, we have a system that you can use that in 
Um, you can change it up by title or by role. So we have different ones that plug in for different roles. So if you're in purchasing, you're going to see a different one than you're going to see if you're in sales or if you're going to see it in operations, you'll see different ads that go in there because it's pertinent to their to, to what they're interested in. Personalization. I like it. Our, our personalization, our best product is called O-Connect. Jim, it's uh, video conferencing. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the USP of the product is going to be it will do language translation from your language to any other language in real time. Mm, like a babble. It's like uh, it does uh, verbal to verbal. It does verbal to text, text to verbal. Mm. So it's quite unique. And uh, it'll be doing Russian and English and Chinese and Farsi and everything all at one time. Wow. Will it, will it go between like Russian and Chinese? Yeah. Perfect. That, that'd be a great product outside the U.S. And there's a, I, I, you should think about putting that into uh, affiliate uh, marketing because you would be able to then uh, open up your uh, overseas markets way faster than you can do it by yourself. And then if you offer a, a bounty on that, um, you'd be surprised like if you were you'd be surprised. So there's some international companies up there um, that, that you could probably get that offer in with. Um, there's a company called Offer Vault, O-F-F-E-R-V-A-U-L-T.com that you would uh, place it on there or place it with a couple of networks so they could get more international support for it. But that's one way I would say that product could grow very easily if you can afford to pay out a, 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 a price on it, like maybe like the first two months uh, uh, subscription fee back out to the affiliate and then give them a lifetime 10% cut off of the subscription fee. You'll keep them promoting that forever and ever and ever. I think we got a better deal than that. Even we are an affiliate company, so yeah. Oh well, there you go. Hey, way better. <laughs> Let me know if you need help with any of the XY sevens of the world. So you might like our tracker system. O Tracker. You talking about tracking websites? We've got the ultimate tracker. Might be something, something that uh, marketing companies will gravitate towards. Does it track UTM codes or was it? A good question. I'm not technical enough to know. <laughs> okay, no problem. That's, a, that's a, what we do is when I came here, we instituted a, a company-wide um, um, memo, but basically, uh, you know, order that no inbound links, no like links from from landing page or from ads or from anything out in the wild. Um, no links will be uh, accepted uh, that they don't have UTMs. So we track literally down to whether it was an image or a text link. Um, that that it came from everything about the ad is tracked everything about the campaign that is uh, that, that it came from is tracked um, so that we can do a complete look back on every piece of creative what did it do how did it compare to this year how did it compare to a static versus a, 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 an animated banner um, how the landing page create uh, do and then people on my team are responsible for optimizing that experience all the way down the line so those are the sorts of things that would, if that would help, that would be something that we, we would definitely be interested in looking at. That's very interesting information that I'll pass along. So thank you very much for being on the Influencers Podcast. You added a great deal to our knowledge base and our audience all around the world, 195 countries. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Bill. All right. Good guys. See you next uh, Wednesday. We'll be back with the Influencers Podcast. Hope your week starts out well, and we will look forward to seeing you back again soon.